Guilt has a way of making itself manifest. This is not to be confused with the legal sense of guilt. This, dear viewer, is the guilt of the heart. The inward pangs of regret, of transgression, of terrible deeds done. It is part of the world we live in, where guilt manifests in ways that cloud the mind, brings sorrow to the heart, and even pain. Let not these words burden you, dear viewer. For this siloed eve, let us be captives of the miracle, as we look into the horror that is blasphemous. For I am your host, critic and narrator of media. Such is my penance, as yours is describing. A woman in dark robes prays fervently as she grips a stone figure. She pleads to make her chest hurt with regret, to forge its punishment and nail it deep, until asking to shape her guilt once more. Without warning, she finds herself impaled, the small figure now a handle to a blade. As she lowers her arms in death, the body becomes stone. A deep violet adorns this act of contrition. For a brief moment, we see only part of someone grabbing hold of the blade. The scenes portrayed in this narration are only a glimpse into the twisted machinations of the miracle. I will give you a warning now before we continue. There will be dark themes, there will be sensitive topics touched on, and there will be blood. If this is too much for you, there are much lighter videos you might prefer down in the description below. With that being said, let us share a glimpse into this triune world of guilt penance, and absolution, for twisted are the paths of the miracle. During your pilgrimage through the plot of Blasphemous, you find many items, usually objects and trinkets that offer buffs and protections for the penitent one. Further into the plot, you are confronted by Chrysanta, one of the guards to Escobar. She accuses you of having committed crimes against the church and its saints but it is the mention of the miracle and its outbreaks that I find most intriguing. The idea that not only were the people of Custodia affected by this entity, but that it would bleed into mundane objects as well, and in such a manner that it was treated like a sudden plague. It has got to him, brother. The miracle is within these walls, said the friar, scared. Grab that piece of wood and help me block his cell, answered the other friar, younger than him. And while they both parted slowly, listening to the screams and banging through the massive wooden door, a small round object rolled from under it. His body was immobilized, and amid cries of repentance, his skin began to turn whiter and whiter until it finally became limestone. And as he was about to become a complete statue, in a final sigh, his tears softened one of his eyes that he managed to separate himself from the rest of his body by falling to the ground. Then we discreetly moved her rigid body of lime from her cell to the lower parts of the Arca Cathedral, along with the other forbidden statues. We put a wide loom over her so that no one else would know that under her would sleep, punished by the miracle, the great scribe. We turn our attention to the three sisters. This small tale is given to us through three quest items, the first being the torn vital ribbon, the second a black grieving veil. Yes, brother, it's been a long time since I stopped officiating nuptials. Since today those three sisters embraced each other, praying, since the day they asked the miracle itself to help them to avoid such a holy bond. No one knows what they asked for in that prayer nor why they didn't want to be wedded. The miracle, with its grievous plans, went to the aid of the sisters. If you can call that aid. What would convince a man to no longer marry couples so quickly is the thought I had to myself. A thought that was explained by the third item, the melted golden coins. I was there. I bore witness to that creation. 
The hairs of the sisters grew and braided, wrapping around them, making a terrifying crunching noise until it covered them completely, shaping itself as an egg. An egg made of rough, knotty hair. The idea that this miracle would define Grace as destroying three women inside of a gross egg made of their collective hair is wildly disgusting. And finding all three items you can offer them to the massive egg of naughty hair. Three voices will make a rejection of their betrothed in relation to each item before hatching. These poor souls were forced into a single being described as birthing a grievous miracle called Altus Gracius. You are then given something described as immaculate, an egg of deformity. The grotesque being says to take it with you, for it is too late for these deformed bodies. Could you imagine praying for freedom from a wedding and getting the response of becoming a giant chimera of eggy hair? And this was considered a blessing. The smaller egg isn't any less grotesque, containing three tongues after being hatched at the lightning struck tree. Taking this into the false dream to be blessed gives you the relic, three gnarled tongues. This allows the player to access various areas where roots are visible, but to contemplate that there could be this living knot of tongues forcing roots to grow in such a twisted manner. It just the idea of holding moving living tongues in your pocket. Hidden beneath Alboro in a dark cave is Nascimento. It is not so much the feet nailed to a plank, but the face growing on his chest. It is not described as simply an ancient visage, but one that grows older while his face grows younger to the point of looking like a child. Nascimento laments that he doesn't understand his purpose, no matter how much he reflects on the sin he may have committed to deserve it. In a desperate bid to lessen the punishment, he offers to help the penitent one. Helping does not lessen it and eventually the old man starts birthing from Nascimento, an awful and excruciating visual of gross fluids and agony until the eventual death. I'm not sure how else to describe this interpretation of Nascimento's torment other than fucked. I thought maybe it was just an endless loop of birthing himself, something related to the theme of repetition and the second ending, but I don't think it is. I think Nascimento is on the receiving end of punishment for either having defiled a child or for planning to. The cautious way he emphasizes that no matter how much he reflects on the sins he may have committed, I I can't help but interpret the elderly visage as either the ill intent or denial of his actions being ever present. And as the visage begins to exit his body, the pain and agony of the childish face as the Ancient One forces his way through the body. It doesn't need to be spelled out to see what this could be insinuating. There are other characters you meet along the way that, for the most part, tend to find peace or fade away, but not him. He is left here, nothing more than an empty husk of a defiled youth and the monster that now lies before it. And I don't know if this old man is the frailty leftover of the victim or if it's just the horrid representation of someone who would commit such an abhorrent action. Sometimes the reality of what inspires works of art can be more terrible than the works inspired. You know, I had an ending bit for this, and, uh... 
yeah, I just, there's very few things that get to me, and this is one of those things that do. I, like, any time I go back to this game, I don't upgrade the bio flasks anymore, just because after, you know, going through interpretations of what, you know, various things could be, which I was doing for this video, and, um, yeah, I just don't bother going to that character anymore. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to say, really. I'll see you guys in the next video.